Good morning. How y'all doing? Y'all. Y'all. Every once in a while, I had a, my best friend in college was from Virginia, and we worked together in maintenance. We went to class together. We actually served in student government together. And so for three years, hanging out at least three or four hours a day with somebody from, from Virginia, Virginia, like rural Virginia, um, I, I learned all kinds of things. And y'all is the one that every once in a while shows back up um, in my vocabulary sometimes. So that's kind of fun. Before I get into this morning's message, I want to give a shout out um, because I think we should celebrate some of these sort of things. There is a young couple that's been a part of our congregation, and they recently have gotten engaged, and I'd like to have them stand up, DJ and Kennedy, woo Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I also found out in the course of talking with DJ and a couple of the other people that back during COVID, another one of our young couples actually got married and no one was able to celebrate that moment with them because of COVID. So I'm like, you know what? Why not? Let's do it now. So Tim and Shana, we want to celebrate you. Because you know what? Sometimes you need to be excited about the right things. Now, I get excited about a lot of things, chocolate, pizza, ice cream in particular. I really get excited about ice cream. Um, and I think that's one of the right things to be excited about. But I also think that we get sometimes a little too excited about some of the wrong things. Um, and I won't go into some of those wrong things because that could maybe create some tension this morning, and I'm trying to avoid that. But can we be excited about Christmas? Wow. I'm not sure everyone's in agreement about that. Can we be, like, not just a little excited about Christmas, but a lot excited about Christmas this morning? If you need a little bit of Christmas cheer, would you just turn around, and Steve, would you stand up? Can you just not get excited about somebody wearing a sparkling Christmas hat? I mean, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Well, but you're the one that's wearing it in service with the lights flashing. I got to admit, that's awesome. See, this morning we're talking about exclamations of joy. And I don't know about you, but an exclamation needs to be something that has a little energy to it. I'm not of the opinion that if somebody goes, oh, that that's an exclamation. <laughs> that's a sigh with words attached to it, or a sound that sounds like a word. You know, when somebody's like, that's exciting, that's not an exclamation. That's verbiage. An exclamation is something that even when we write it down, has a big, tall point that you put a stabby thing on the bottom of. And just the act of doing that, whoosh, that's an exclamation. There's something that stands out about that. And when it comes to Advent, I know that a lot of times when we get into Advent and there's some candles behind us, there's often a very deeply reflective and very worshipful space to that, and that's wonderful. But the reality is, is we have so much to be excited about. We have so much to be excited as we reflect on the long, remembering the long-awaited Jesus. We do await his second coming. Just like the people that we're reading about in the book of Luke, and we're going to be turned there this morning, so if you brought a Bible, you can look at Luke chapter 1. There was a group of people who were awaiting Christ's first coming. And they were living in a dark and broken world. They were living under occupation. They were, had been invaded by a foreign army. They couldn't govern themselves. They couldn't rule themselves. They had to submit to a foreign people who could make their lives really, really miserable and did. That's a dark time. They lived in a time where health and sickness were not what we normally enjoy. And yeah, it's been a rough season. Thank you, everyone, for praying for Pam and I. COVID sucks. If it's okay to say that word, I apologize if it's not. But COVID just is horrible. 
And uh, Pam ran a fever for nine straight days. Thank you for praying for her. Um, and we're still on that edge of trying to get energy back. And I know so many of you, you're here this morning, you're trying to get over the flu, you're, you're trying to take precautions, and we want to be wise in how we come together. We want to be careful about how we're um, loving one another well, even in trying to protect each other from some of the sickness and going on. And, and yesterday we did a memorial service for a 20-year-old who went home to the glory way too soon. Our world's still dark. When we look at the scriptures, it's easy to say their world was dark, but our world is still dark too. And we're awaiting Jesus' second coming. And so when we get into the Advent season, that sense of longing for something more than we have, that sense of waiting for somebody who can set things right, we can understand it because with every year that passes, it seems like our world gets a little darker, a little more broken. We read in the news of wars and occupation, and we read of people suffering in the cold and sickness and death. It's still very much a part of our world, just as much today as it was there. But there is a difference. They were waiting for somebody to show up. God. And yes, we are waiting for the day he comes back and shows up in a very literal way in this world. But the truth is, From the day he came, that first Christmas till now, God is still with us. And he's still pouring out his gifts on us. And we have so much to be excited about. So this morning, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 1. And we're starting a part 1 and a part 2. I'm going to start part 1 of Zachariah's song. And next week, Rebecca is going to get to finish that. And so as we turn to the Bible this morning, we are rejoicing Because the gifts that Zechariah is going to describe as coming into the world are gifts we still get to experience even more powerfully and fully than he ever imagined. So we're in Luke chapter 1. We're going to start verse 8 because we need to get a little context. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by law according to the customs of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for burning incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. Can anyone give an amen to that? I mean, let's be honest. You're in a room by yourself. You're the only one in there. And you turn around and suddenly there's somebody standing right by the altar of incense who was not there just a minute ago. Every single one of us would have been startled and filled with fear. Okay, let's be honest. But the angel said to him those classic words, do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked his wife, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Now, this is kind of one of those moments where As a communicator, you know that sometimes you're going to make a statement and people are going to hear the first statement you make and it's going to be so surprising or so startling or so impactful that they don't hear the rest of what you say. And this is a classic example of that. Because Zachariah's not going like, wait, God's coming? Wait, the Spirit of the Lord is going to inhabit my son? Like Elijah? Wait! He doesn't get excited about all the big, cool stuff. He's like, time out. I'm old. (laughs) (laughs) And my wife's a little long in years. Now, guys, that's a really good way of saying that in case you have, as you're aging, it's okay for you to say you're old and then just say, my wife's getting a little farther along in years too. That's, That's a nice way. But can you see that he got stuck? He got stuck on an impossibility 
that kept him from hearing all the promise. And I want to encourage you in that. Sometimes God's going to speak something to your heart. He's going to speak something to your circumstance. He might even speak something to you this morning in this message that might seem so impossible to where you are right now that you will lose the promise of possibility attached to it. How can this be? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Many, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he had stayed so long at the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he'd seen a vision at the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. Now we're going to jump down, because in this moment, Luke, as a kind of a cool author does so many times, he starts with one group of people in one context, and then he shifts the story to another group of characters. And we've talked about Mary, and that was part of what we've been speaking to, and uh, didn't our missionary last week do a phenomenal job in bringing that message? That was awesome. We were watching online. So all of you who are watching online, good morning. We're so glad you're here. We're going to jump down to verse 57. This is where we pick back up with Zachariah and Elizabeth's story. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared in her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no. Now, my Bible puts an exclamation point behind that, because <laughs> she's wanting to make sure they understand that this is not just a mild little disagreement. This is an emphatic exclamation of No. His name, he is to be called John. Somewhere in this intervening time, Zechariah, in his silence, communicated with Elizabeth the promise. He got over the shock, and obviously he can't talk, he can't tell, he can't explain. But we're very clear here by the implication of this that he had communicated with her the substance of what the angel had said. His name is John. That's what he's to be called. And they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. Now, if you go back, and I read the context because I think it was important. If you go back, the only clear instruction, the only outright instruction the angel gave to Zechariah was, you are to call him John. Now the angel also said, you will remain in this place until, until the day this happens. Now, I have to admit, as I was reading this passage and preparing for this message, I realized I had actually been walking in perhaps a faulty assumption my whole life after having read this passage because I'm sitting there going, well, wait a minute. You will be silent until this happens. Well, he didn't burst out in song the moment John came into the world. He didn't burst out in song the moment Elizabeth came to him and said, honey, guess what? I'm pregnant! And he's like, woohoo! No, that, that wasn't the moment. The moment he was released from this silence was the moment he was able to put the angel's instruction into action. And there on that eighth day, as he has held his son in his arms for eight days, as he is celebrated in silence, this incredible miracle and gift 
In this moment, when the crowd won't listen to his wife, and he says, give me the tablet. And he writes those words. His name is John. That's the moment he was released from his silence. Because that's the moment he got to put the angel's instructions into, moment, into motion. In that context, in that setting. And oh, does he release this powerful and wonderful praise. He began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe throughout the hill country of Judea. We're talking about all these things, and everyone was wondering about him, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. And why is it such a big deal? Why is it such a big deal that he would actually, the angel would make such an important moment out of the time in space, when Zechariah would say, his name is John. I believe that part of maybe perhaps the answer to that is because sometimes a name is more than just a name. Sometimes a name is more than just a name. As I was sitting at the computer this morning in the back and before everyone got here and Emma was there, I'm like, Emma, what does your name mean? She goes, I don't know. So we looked it up. And it's really cool because M is a variation of Emmanuel, God with us. Part of the Hebrew definition of Emma, according to what we saw, means whole, complete. God's grace and giving. I'm like, wow, that's really cool, Emma. That's really cool. Maybe your name isn't just a name. And see, the Hebrews never, under, never saw a name as just a name. They didn't sit down and pick up a baby book because they thought something sounded cool. They saw the name as being key to the identity of the one who would bear that name. And this name, John's name, wasn't given by Zechariah or his wife. It was given by God. Because every time they said John, or in Hebrew, Jokanan, or a way I can't pronounce, joke, it said the next slide, J-O-C-H-A-N-A-N. It means Jehovah has graced, or as Thayer's dictionary puts it, Jehovah is a gracious giver. Now that had a ton of meaning for Zechariah, and for Elizabeth, because every time they hold this little baby, every time they're watching him toddling around, every time they see him playing in the yard, every time they see him growing, every time they see him becoming a young man and learning the Torah, they just are sitting there going, God answered our prayers, and God is a gracious giver. And it had profound meaning to them. But Zechariah's song, which is at the heart of our message this morning, is a spirit-filled prophetic revelation, and it's an unpacking of what God wanted to give to his people. And Zechariah's song, I'm sure, resonated in his heart all the days of John's life. Every time he said, John, come here, he was saying, God is a gracious give her. Come here. And I want to unpack. Like Santa's proverbial bag, I want to unpack all the gifts that we're going to find in just the first half of Zechariah's song. So can you stay with me? Because I'm going to try to go fast, which means I'm going to talk fast. So if I go too fast, just somebody say, slow down. Zechariah's song begins in verse 67. I'm going to read through the first the passage we're going to look at, and then we're going to come back to it bit by bit. His Zechariah, remember, he's praising God. He's speaking. His tongue is unleashed. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. 
salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. Can you hear a man who's been mute for over nine months? These are the first words he's getting to say. And there's praise to his God. Because this little baby is a culmination of promise. Praise be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come. He's come. Zechariah isn't looking anymore for God to step into his world. He's not waiting. He's saying, in this baby is the proof God has come. Right here, right now, in this world. And he's redeemed them. Now, I love it when people are so confident of what God's going to do, they talk about what is yet to come in the past tense. He has come and he has redeemed them. It's done. And he's holding the baby who says this is God's gracious gift to us. And then he's going to move into this prophetic space He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now, we already just talked about in the last couple of weeks about the interlude of Mary coming and Mary's yes and amen to God. May it be unto me as you have spoken. And Elizabeth, how is it that the mother of my Lord has come? The baby inside me leapt with joy as I heard your voice. Zechariah is giving his own voice to what he has been able to sit in silence, reflecting and marveling on. Because those three months that Mary stayed with him, he's sitting there going, God, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. I don't know what it's going to look like fully, but I know what you're doing because you have been faithful and you have raised up for us a deliverer out of the house of David. And I've gotten to sit here and watch it and think about it and meditate on it for three months. And I guarantee I'm going to tell you what he's doing. Now, some of you, I really feel you've been holding on to a promise for certain people in your lives. Their redemption. Their salvation. The day that they get delivered. And there's a hard moment sometimes when you hold on to a promise, but you don't see the fulfillment of it yet. But I want you to be encouraged this morning that Zechariah, in this moment, because he had doubted, let's be honest, that's part of his story. You didn't believe me. You didn't believe me, but just because you didn't believe me doesn't mean God's not going to be God. And just because you don't always believe the things God has promised that will come to pass in your life doesn't mean God's going to be like, okay, fine, I'm not doing it. No. If God spoke it, he is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. If God gives an emphatic, this will be promise, it will be. And I want to encourage you this morning. If he has promised to redeem and save and deliver somebody in your life, just keep celebrating it. Just keep celebrating it. God, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. Because you're God, and we're not. And that person doesn't know how much you love them yet, but they're going to. God, they're wrestling with you. But I know you're going to win. You told me. We have something to be excited about even in the infancy of a promise. Jehovah has given the gift of presence. Jehovah has given 
the ransom of liberation. And that word is a very key word, ransom. It's a very key word. It literally means the payment for somebody's freedom. And Zechariah is promising over his infant son, John, who was born months ahead of the infant Jesus, what would be accomplished on the cross of Calvary. But he's saying the price has already been paid because the child's already been born. The child's already been conceived. This is done. Jehovah has given David's descendant the strength and might to rescue. That's really what he's saying. God has raised up a horn of salvation. He is saying God has given David's descendant a gift of strength and might to save us. And that word for salvation is a big concept. It includes rescuing, which we'll see more in this passage. But more than rescuing us, it includes making us safe. It takes us from the place of pain and bondage and hurt and brokenness and captivity and brings us to a place where we can be safe where we can be brought to a place of health and wholeness. I think that's pretty cool that Emma's name means wholeness. God wants to give all of us wholeness. In every place of hurt and brokenness, every gap, every hole in our heart, He wants to give us wholeness. That's part of the promise of salvation. Which Zechariah goes on to say, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Now, I know that at that time it would be easy, and it was true, to say that the Romans hated the Jews. But Zechariah and Scripture speak to a greater enemy and a greater adversary who constantly acts with hate and detest of us. And you know there's those moments when somebody doesn't like you and they just ignore you? That's their, that's their like, okay, I don't like you, so I don't have to be with you. Yeah. That's painful. But it's not as painful as somebody who says, I hate you and I detest you and I'm going to do everything in my power to make you miserable. I'll do everything in my power to destroy you. And Zechariah prophetically was speaking of the great adversary of God's people then and now, and his name is Satan. Satan is real. He is. He is the adversary of God's people. He is the adversary of God. And do you know how he loves to hurt God? By hurting the people God created. By admiring us in sin, in darkness, in death. He hates God and he hates God's creation and he hates God's people. And he's constantly acting as an adversary against us. And the promise that Zechariah gives is one that's worth being a little excited about. Because we have a savior from that hatred. We have a savior from that level of malignant activity. And whenever Satan comes against us, we have one who has come to save us from his hand, from his acts of harm, from his acts of opposition. And his name is Jesus Christ. And that's something to be excited about. Because we live in a culture and we live in a world where we see the activity of Satan all around us. And we see him trying to destroy the dignity of God's creation in the form of this world and ultimately in the form of man. Whenever we see humanity acting in forms of ugliness and violence and harm and brokenness and sin and degradation, that is Satan's ultimate purpose, to destroy the creation and the capstone of creation, humanity. But Jesus came to set us free from that. And he came to set us free from the enemy's attacks against us as believers. 
to show our mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. It is so amazing and it is so cool that God graciously gives compassion and kindness to demonstrate his mercy to those who have come before. Think about it. Zachariah is looking at this little baby and he is saying, God, this is a sign of your faithfulness to Moses and your covenant people. This is a sign of faithfulness to David, the one you promised would always have a king who would sit on your throne. This is a sign of faithfulness going back to Father Abraham and the promises given to him that you would bless his descendants. Paul tells us in Romans that you and I are blessed through Abraham. We have been grafted into the tree that is formed by the roots of the covenant promises given to Abraham. This blessing of celebration is about us too. And I'm thinking in this moment of all the faithful saints who have prayed for us. Do you know that God's faithfulness in your life right now is a sign of his mercy and a gift of his compassion to the people who have been praying for you, who may not even be on this earth to pray for you anymore, but join Jesus around the throne where he ever lives to make intercession for the saints? Do you realize that your loved ones who have gone before in Jesus, they're not done believing and praying for you because Jesus isn't done. Right now, Jesus is making intercession for us. He's praying for us. And I believe with all my heart that those who are a part of his body join him in that ministry there. Do you realize that the miracles that we are experiencing right now are a sign of God's blessing to those who have gone before? God is faithful yesterday, today, and forevermore to rescue us from the hands of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear. God graciously extends his hands and power to draw, to pull us out of the hand of our enemies and gather us to himself. How many of you love a good hero story? How many of you love that moment when the hero walks up to the bad guy and just pops him. Can I be just, I mean, I do. I'm just going to be honest. Because usually the bad guy is so bad, you want him to get it. And you want to see him beaten. And isn't it a powerful moment after the hero knocks out the enemy and there's that moment oftentimes where he gathers that captive into the the arm, extends a hand, pulls them to safety. He rescues them. And there's that visceral moment where somebody in pain and in captivity and hurt makes contact with the one who just fought against the odds to save them. And I want you to know this morning that you are God wants to touch you personally. This isn't generic. This isn't just big, although it's global and universal. It's personal. Because he wants you to know you are loved. He wants you to know that he cares about the battle you've been facing. He wants you to know that when he breaks through the enemy's affliction, there are alarms of safety and love and strength and protection to hold you. See, Zachariah is giving praise to a very personal God, not just a very big God. And as we walk through this morning together, I pray that you will feel the personal love of your Redeemer, your Savior, your Healer, your Hope, your Great Physician, connecting with you. And this is the final piece. Worship team, you can come. He has come to rescue us from the hands of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear 
and holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. Because think about it. What is it that ultimately keeps us from being able to embrace the relationship with God? It's our own guilty conscience. It's our own powerlessness. It's our own wrestling with God. I want to love you. I want to serve you. But that shame that comes over us that says, but God, I blew it. God, I've been trying. I have been so trying. But I keep blowing it. I don't want to do this this way anymore. Zachariah's exclamation of joy is the one that says we don't have to do it that way anymore. That there is a power available to us to overcome every sin, every addiction, every form of bondage that Satan has ever been able to hook us into. And we, when we receive his grace, receive his love, and receive his spirit within us, can look at sin and look at temptation, look it in the face, and say, no. No. I don't have to do that anymore. I'm not bound to that anymore. That habit, that sin, does not have to define who I am anymore more. I can love God, and I can love him with a clear conscience, and I can love him and walk with him in righteousness and holiness. That is Zachariah's exclamation point to this part of his song. Riker, would you lead us in this first song? Rejoice, 
celebration. If you need the communion elements, please just raise your hand. They're going to come around and make sure that everyone has them. If you don't, go ahead and take them. There's two sides to this one. There's not two tricky little layers. There's just two sides. If you go ahead and open up the bread, you can be seated if you want. You can make standing however you want. This morning, I'm going to read a different passage. I'm not going to read the traditional passage. I'm going to read a passage that the Apostle Paul gave us that is an exclamation of joy in our freedom. And we're going to read it in two parts. In Romans chapter 6, Paul would write these words. We are those who have died to sin. So how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This was what Zechariah promised us. This is what Zechariah proclaimed in prophetic celebration. We would be enabled to live without fear. A life of holiness and righteousness. So God, today we thank you for the sacrifice that purchased that. We thank you that Jesus, you went to the cross so we could go to the cross through you. So that we could die to the old nature and the old ways, and we could die to sin and death. And as you were raised, we could be raised to life. So we take the bread this morning in celebration of your death and ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Partake of the bread together.
Paul goes on in this amazing exclamation of joy in our freedom. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Here's the faith component. Believer, here's the faith component we need to practice. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. I want to ask you, as we partake of the cup, if there is a sin that you have stepped into, if this week or in the past weeks there has been a sin that you have offered yourself to, it could be a lie, it could be angry words, it could be a shaken fist or an attitude of your heart, it could be anything. This wasn't what you were bought for, but this is what Christ shed his blood to forgive you of. And this morning, Maybe you need to approach this cup with a simple prayer. Jesus, forgive me. But that's not where we're going to end it. We're going to end it with a celebration of righteousness. And after you have asked him to forgive you of your sins, the worship team is going to lead us in a couple more songs. And I'm going to invite you to offer yourself afresh and anew to God as an act of righteousness. Ask him, empower me, God. Empower me to live rightly. Empower me to do what you're asking me to do. It's a twofold. So before we pray for the cup, I'm just going to pause. If you need to ask God to forgive you of anything, make this right with God in your heart. Jesus, we take this cup that's a covenant of forgiveness.